Act One of Henry the Sixth, Part One, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act One, Scene One. Westminster Abbey. Dead March. Enter the funeral of King Henry the Fifth, attended on by dukes of bedford regent of france gloucester protector the exeter earl of warwick the bishop of winchester heralds etc hung be the heavens with black yield day to night comets importing change of times and states brandish your crystal tresses in the sky and with them scourge the bad revolting stars that have consented unto henry's death king henry the fifth too famous to live long England ne'er lost a king of so much worth. England ne'er had a king until his time. Virtue he had, deserving to command. His brandished sword did blind men with his beams. His arms spread wider than the dragon's wings. His sparking eyes replete with wrathful fire. More dazzled and drove back his enemies than the midday sun. Fierce bent against their faces. What should I say? His deeds exceed all speech. He ne'er lift up his hand, but conquered. We mourn in black. Why mourn we not in blood? Henry is dead, and never shall revive. Upon a wooden coffin we attend, and death's dishonourable victory we, with our stately presence, glorify, like captives bound to a triumphant car. What? Shall we curse the planets of mishap? that plotted thus our glories overthrow? Or shall we think the subtle-witted French conjurers and sorcerers that, afraid of him, by magic verses have contrived his end? He was a king blessed of the king of kings. Unto the French the dreadful judgment day so dreadful will not be as was his sight. The battles of the Lord of Hosts he fought. The church's prayers made him so prosperous. The church? Where is it? Had not churchmen prayed, his thread of life had not so soon decayed. None do you like but an effeminate prince, whom, like a schoolboy, you may overawe. Gloucester, whate'er we like, thou art protector, and lookest to command the prince and realm. Thy wife is proud. She holdeth thee in awe more than God or religious churchmen may. Nay, not religion, for thou lovest the flesh. And nay, throughout the year to church thou goest, except it be to pray against thy foes. Cease, cease these jars, and rest your minds in peace. Let's to the altar. Heralds wait on us. Instead of gold, we'll offer up our arms, since arms avail not now that Henry's dead. Posterity await for wretched years, when at their mother's moist eyes babes shall suck. Our isle be made a nourish of salt tears, and none but women left to wail the dead. Henry the Fifth, thy ghost I invocate. Prosper this realm, keep it from civil broils, combat with adverse planets in the heavens. A far more glorious star thy soul will make than Julius Caesar, or bright— Enter a messenger. My honourable lords, health to you all. Sad tidings bring I to you out of France, of loss, of slaughter, and discomfiture. Guillain, Champagne, Rheims, Orléans, Paris, Guissot, Poitiers are all quite lost. What sayest thou, man, before dead Henry's course? Speak softly, or the loss of those great towns will make him burst his lead and rise from death. Is Paris lost? Is Rouen yielded up? If Henry were recalled to life again, these news would cause him once more yield the ghost. How were they lost? What treachery was used? No treachery, but want of men and money. Amongst the soldiers this is muttered, that here you maintain several factions, and whilst a field should be dispatched and fought, you are disputing of your generals. One would have lingering wars with little cost, another would fly swift but wanteth wings, a third thinks, without expense at all, by guileful fair words peace may be obtained. Awake! Awake, English nobility! Let not sloth dim your horrors new-begot. Cropped are the flower de loose in your arms. Of England's coat one half is cut away. 
were our tears wanting to this funeral these tidings would call forth their flowing tides me they concern regent i am of france give me my steeled coat i'll fight for france away with these disgraceful wailing robes wounds will i lend the french instead of eyes to weep their intermissive miseries enter to them another messenger lords view these letters full of bad mischance france has revolted from the english quite except some petty towns of no import the dauphin charles is crowned king of rheims the bastard of orleans with him is joined Renier, duke of anjou doth take his part the duke of alencon flieth to his side the dauphin crowned king all fly to him oh whither shall we fly from this reproach we will not fly but to our enemies throats bedford if thou be slack i will fight it out Gloucester, why doubtst thou of my forwardness? An army have I mustered in my thoughts, wherewith already France is overrun. Enter another messenger. My gracious lords, to add to your laments, wherewith you now bedew King Henry's hearse, I must inform you of a dismal fight betwixt the stout Lord Talbot and the French. What, wherein Talbot overcame? Is't so? Oh, no, wherein Lord Talbot was all thrown. The circumstance I'll tell you more at large. The tenth of August last this dreadful lord, retiring from the siege of Orléans, having full scarce six thousand in his troop, by three and twenty thousand of the French, was round encompassed and set upon. No leisure had he to enrank his men. He wanted pikes to set before his archers. Instead whereof sharp stakes plucked out of hedges, they pitched in the ground confusedly, to keep the horsemen off from breaking in. More than three hours the fight continued where valiant Talbot, above human thought, enacted wonders with his sword and lance. Hundreds he sent to hell, and none durst stand him. Here, there, and everywhere enraged he flew. The French exclaimed, The devil was in arms. All the whole army stood gazed on him. His soldiers spying his undaunted spirit, A Talbot! A Talbot! cried out amain, and rushed into the bowels of the battle. Here had the conquest fully been sealed up, if Sir John Fastolf had not played the coward. He, being an avowed, placed behind with purpose to relieve and follow them, cowardly fled, not having struck one stroke. Hence grew the general wreck and massacre. Enclosed were they with their enemies. A base walloon to win the Dauphin's grace thrust Talbot with a spear into the back, whom all France with their chief assembled strength durst not presume to look once in the face. Is Talbot slain? Then I will slay myself for living idly here in pomp and ease, whilst such a worthy leader wanting aid unto his dastard foeman is betrayed. Oh, no, he lives, but is took prisoner, and Lord Scales with him and Lord Hungerford, most of the rest slaughtered or took likewise. His ransom there is none but I shall pay. I'll hail the Dauphin headlong from his throne. His crown shall be the ransom of my friend. Four of their lords I'll change for one of ours. Farewell, my masters, to my task will I. Bonfires in France forthwith I am to make, to keep our great St. George's feast withal. Ten thousand soldiers with me I will take, whose bloody deeds shall make all Europe quake. So you had need, for Orléans is besieged. The English army is grown weak and faint. The Earl of Salisbury craveth supply, and hardly keeps his men from mutiny, since they so few watch such a multitude. Remember, lords, your oaths to Henry sworn, either to quell the Dauphin utterly, or bring him in obedience to your yoke. I do remember it, and here take my leave to go about my preparation. Exit. I'll to the tower with all the haste I can, to view the artillery and munition, and then... I will proclaim young Henry king. Exit. To Eltham will I, where the young king is, being ordained his special governor, and for his safety there I'll best devise. Exit. Hm. Each hath his place and function to attend. I am left out. For me nothing remains. But long I will not be jack out of office. The king from Eltham I intend to steal and sit at chief astern of public wheel. Exeunt. Scene two. France. Before Orleans. Sound a flourish. Enter Charles, Alençon, and Rainier, marching with drum and soldiers. 
Mars, his true moving, even as in the heaven, so in the earth, to this day is not known. Late did he shine upon the English side. Now we are victors. Upon us he smiles. What towns of any moment what do we have? At pleasure here we lie near Orléans. Otherwise the famished English, like pale ghosts, faintly besiege us one hour in a month. They want their porridge and their fat bull beeves. Either they must be dieted like mules and have their provender tied to their mouths, or piteous they will look like drowned mice. Let's raise the siege while live we idly here. Talbot is taken whom we want to fear. Remaineth none but mad brain Salisbury, and he may well in fretting spend his skull, nor men nor money hath he to make war. Sound, sound alarm! We will rush on them. Now for the honor of the forlorn French. Him I forgive my death that killeth me when he sees me go back on one foot or fly. Exeunt. Here, alarm. They are beaten back by the English with great loss. Re-enter Charles, Alencion, and Rainier. Who e'er saw their like? What men have I? Dogs! Cowards, dastards! I would ne'er have fled but that they left me midst my enemies. Salisbury is a desperate homicide. He fighteth as one weary of his life. The other lords, like lions wanting food, do rush upon us as their hungry prey. Froissart, a countryman of ours, records England, all Oliver's and Rowland's bread, during the time Edward the Third did reign. More truly now may this be verified, for none but Samson's and Goliath's it sendeth forth to skirmish. One to ten, lean raw-boned rascals, who would e'er suppose they had such courage and audacity? Let's leave this town, for they are hair-brained slaves, and hunger will enforce them to be more eager. Of old I know them, rather with their teeth the walls they'll tear down than forsake the siege. I think by some odd game or sore device, their arms are set like clocks stiff to strike on, else ne'er could they hold out so as they do. By my consent we'll even let them alone. Be it so. Enter the bastard of Orleans. Well, the Prince Dauphin, I have news for him. Bastard of Orleans, thrice welcome to us. Methinks your looks are sad, your cheer appalled. Hath the late overthrow wrought this offence? Be not dismayed, for succor is at hand. A holy maid hither with me I bring, which by a vision sent to her from heaven, ordained us to raise this tedious siege, and drive the English forth the bounds of France. The spirit of deep prophecy she hath, exceeding the nine sibyls of old Rome. What's past and what's to come she can descry. Speak. Shall I call her in? Believe my words, for they are certain and infallible. Go, call her in. Exit the bastard of Orleans. But first to try her skill, Renier, stand thou as Dauphin in my place. Question her proudly, let thy looks be stern. By this means shall we sound what skill she hath. Re-enter the bastard of Orleans with Joan La Pucelle. Fair maid, is thou wilt to do these wondrous feats? Renier, is it so that thinkest to beguile me? Where is the Dauphin? Come, come from behind. I know thee well, though never seen before. Be not amazed, there's nothing hid from me. In private will I talk with thee apart. Stand back, you lords, and give us leave a while. She takes upon her bravely at first dash. Dauphin, I am by birth a shepherd's daughter, my wit untrained in any kind of art. Heaven and Our Lady gracious has it pleased to shine on my contemptible estate. Lo, whilst I waited on my tender lambs, and to sun-sparching heat displayed my cheeks, God's mother deigned to appear to me, and in a vision full of majesty willed me to leave my base vocation and free my country from calamity 
her aid she promised and assured success in complete glory she revealed herself and whereas i was black and swart before with those clear rays which infused on me that beauty am i blessed with which you see ask me what question thou canst possible and i will answer unpremeditated my courage try by combat if thou darest and thou shalt find that i exceed my sex resolve on this thou shalt be fortunate if thou receive me for thy warlike mate thou hast astonished me with thy high terms only this proof i'll of thy valour make in single combat thou shalt buckle with me and if thou vanquishest thy words are true otherwise i renounce all confidence i am prepared here is my keen-edged sword decked with five flower de luces on each side the which at touraine in saint catherine's churchyard out of a great deal of old iron i chose forth then come o god's name i fear no woman and while i live i'll ne'er fly from a man they fight and joan la pucelle overcomes stay stay thy hands thou art an amazon and fightest with the sword of deborah christ's mother helps me else i were too weak whoever helps thee tis thou that must help me impatiently i burn with thy desire my heart and hands thou hast at once subdued excellent pucella if thy name be so let me thy servant and not sovereign be tis the french dauphin suest to thee thus i must not yield to any rights of love for my profession sacred from above when i have chased all thy foes from hence then will i think upon the recompense meantime look gracious on thy prostrate thrall my lord methinks is very long in talk doubtless he shrives this woman to her smock else ne'er could he so long protract his speech shall we disturb him since he keeps no mean he may mean more than we poor men do know these women are shrewd tempters with their tongues my lord where are you what device you on shall we give over orleans or no why no i say distrustful recreants fight till the last gasp i will be your guard what she says i'll confirm we'll fight it out assigned am i to be the english scourge this night the siege assuredly i'll raise expect saint martin's summer halcyon days since i have entered into these wars glory is like a circle in the water which never ceases to enlarge itself till by broad spreading it dispersed to naught with henri's death the english circle ends dispersed are the glories it included now am i like that proud insulting ship which caesar and his fortune bear at once was mahomet inspired with a dove thou with an eagle art inspired then helen the mother of great constantine nor yet son philip's daughters were like thee bright star of venus fallen down on the earth how may i reverently worship thee enough leave off delays and let us raise the siege woman do what thou canst to save our honours drive them from orleans and be immortalized presently we'll try come let's away about it no prophet will i trust if she prove false exeunt scene three london before the tower enter gloucester with his serving men in blue coats i am come to survey the tower this day since henry's death i fear there is conveyance where be these warders that they wait not here open the gates tis gloucester that calls within who's there that knocks so imperiously it is the noble duke of gloucester where he be you may not be let in villains answer you so the lord protector the lord protect him so we answer him we do no otherwise than we are willed who willed you or whose will stands but mine there's none protector of the realm but i break up the gates i'll be your warrant eyes shall i be flouted thus by dunghill grooms 
Gloucester's men rush at the tower gates, and Woodville, the lieutenant, speaks within. What noise is this? What traitors have we here? Lieutenant, is it you whose voice I hear? Open the gates. Here's Gloucester that would enter. Have patience, noble duke. I may not open. The Cardinal of Winchester forbids. From him I have express commandment that thou, or none of thine, shall be let in. Faint-hearted Woodvile, prizest him for me? Arrogate Winchester, that haughty prelate, whom Henry, our late sovereign, make could brook. Thou art no friend to God or to the king. Open the gates, or I'll shut thee out shortly. Open the gates unto the Lord Protector, or we'll burst them open, if that you come not quickly. Enter to the Protector of the Tower Gates, Bishop of Winchester, and his men in tawny coats. How now, ambitious Humphrey? What means this? Peeled priest, dost thou command me to be shut out? I do, thou most usurping proditor, and not protector of the king or realm. Stand back, thou manifest conspirator, thou that contrivits to murder our dead lord, thou that givest whores indulgences to sin. I'll canvass thee in thy broad cardinal's hat, if thou proceed in this thy insolence. Nay, stand thou back, I will not budge a foot. This be Damascus, be thou cursed cane to slay thy brother Abel, if thou wilt. I will not slay thee, but I'll drive thee back. Thy scarlet robes as a child's burying cloth I'll use to carry thee out of this place. Do what thou darest. I bid thee to thy face. What? Am I dead and bearded to my face? Draw, men, for all this privileged place. Blue coats to tawny coats. Priest, beware your beard. I mean to tug it and to cuff you soundly. Under my feet I stamp thy cardinal's hat. In spite of pope or dignities of church, here by the cheeks I'll drag thee up and down. Gloucester, thou wilt answer this before the Pope. Winchester goose, I cry, a rope, a rope! Now, beat them hence. Why do you let them stay? Thee I'll chase hence, thou wolf in sheep's array. Out, tawny coat, out, scarlet hypocrite! Here Gloucester's men beat out Bishop of Winchester's men, and enter in the hurly-burly the Mayor of London and his officers. Fie, lords, that you, being supreme magistrates, thus contumeliously should break the peace. Peace, Mayor, thou knowest little of my wrongs. Here's Beaufort that regards nor God nor King, hath here destroyed the tower to his use. Here's Gloucester, a foe to citizens, one that still motions war and never peace, overcharging your free purses with large fines, that seeks to overthrow religion because he is protector of the realm, and would have armour here out of the tower, to crown himself king and suppress the prince. I will not answer thee with words but blows. Here they skirmish again. Nought rests for me in this tumultuous strife, but to make open proclamation. Come, officer, as loud as e'er thou canst cry. All manner of men assembled here in arms this day against God's peace and the King's, we charge and command you, in His Highness's name, to repair to your several dwelling places, and not to wear, handle, or use any sword, weapon, or dagger henceforward upon pain of death. Cardinal, I'll be no breaker of the law, but we shall meet and break our minds at large. Gloucester, we will meet, to thy cost be sure. Thy heart-blood I will have for this day's work. I'll call for clubs, if you will not away. This cardinal's more haughty than the devil. Mayor, farewell. Thou does but what thou mayest. Abominable Gloucester, guard thy head, for I intend to have it ere long. Exeunt severally, Gloucester and the Bishop of Winchester with their serving-men. See the coast cleared, and then we will depart. Good God, these nobles should such stomachs bear. I myself fight not once in forty year. Exeunt. Scene four, Orleans. Enter on the walls a master gunner and his boy. Sirrah, thou knowest how Orleans is besieged, and how the English have the suburbs won. Father, I know, and oft have shot at them, howe'er unfortunate I missed my aim. But now thou shalt not. 
be thou ruled by me. Chief Master Gunner am I of this town. Something I must do to procure me grace. The prince's espials have informed me how the English in the suburbs close entrenched want through a secret grate of iron bars in yonder tower to overpeer the city, and thence discover how with most advantage they may vex us with shot or with assault. To intercept this inconvenience, a piece of ordnance against it I have placed, and even these three days have I watched, if I could see them. Now do thou watch, for I can stay no longer. If thou spiest any, run and bring me word, and thou shalt find me at the governor's. Exit. Father, I warrant you, take you no care. I'll never trouble you, if I may spy them. Exit. Enter on turrets, Salisbury and Talbot, Glensdale, Gargrave, and others. Talbot, my life, my joy, again returned. How wert thou handled being prisoner, or by what means gotst thou to be released? Discourse, I prithee, on this turret's top. The Duke of Bedford had a prisoner, called the brave Lord Ponton de Sancheray. For him was I exchanged and ransomed, but with a baser man of arms by far. Once in contempt they would have bartered me, which I, disdaining, scorned, and craved death rather than I would be so vile esteemed. In fine, redeemed I was as I desired. But, oh, the treacherous Fastolf wounds my heart, whom with my bare fists I would execute, if I now had him brought into my power. Yet tellst thou not how thou wert entertained. With scoffs and scorns and contumelious taunts, in open market-place produced they me to be a public spectacle to all. Here, said they, is the terror of the French, the scarecrow that affrights our children so. Then broke I from the officers that led me, and with my nails digged stones out of the ground, to hurl at the beholders of my shame. My grisly countenance made others fly, none durst come near, for fear of sudden death. In iron walls they deemed me not secure, so great fear of my name amongst them was spread that they supposed I could rend bars of steel, and spurn in pieces posts of adamant. Wherefore a guard of chosen shot I had, that walked about me every minute while, and if I did but stir out of my bed, ready they were to shoot me to the heart. Enter the boy with a linstock. I grieve to hear what torments you endured, but we will be revenged sufficiently. Now it is supper time in Orleans. Here through this grate I count each one, and view the Frenchmen how they fortify. Let us look in, the sight will much delight thee. Sir Thomas Gargrave and Sir William Glonsdale, let me have your express opinions, where is the best place to make our battery next? I think at the north gate, for there stand lords. And I here, at the bulwark of the bridge. For aught I see, the city must be famished. Oh with light skirmishes enfeebled. Here they shoot. Salisbury and Gargrave fall. O Lord, have mercy on us wretched sinners. O Lord, have mercy on me, woeful man. What chance is this that suddenly hath crossed us? Speak, Salisbury, at least if thou canst speak. How fairest thou, mirror of all martial men? One of thy eyes and thy cheek side struck off. A cursed tower, a cursed fatal hand, that hath contrived this woeful tragedy. In thirteen battles Salisbury overcame. Henry the fifth he first trained to the wars. Whilst any trumpeted sound or drum struck up, his sword did ne'er leave striking in the field. Yet livest thou, Salisbury? Though thy speech doth fail, one eye thou hast to look to heaven for grace. The sun with one eye vieweth all the world. Heaven, be thou gracious to none alive, if Salisbury wants mercy at thy hands. Bear hence his body, I will help to bury it. Sir Thomas Gargrave, hast thou any life? Speak unto Talbot. Nay, look up to him. Salisbury, cheer thy spirit with his comfort. Thou shalt not die whiles. 
he beckons with his hand and smiles on me as who should say when i am dead and gone remember to avenge me on the french plantagenet i will i like thee nero play on the lute beholding the towns burn wretched shall france be only in my name hear an alarum and it thunders and lightens what stir is this what tumults in the heavens whence comes this alarum and the noise enter a messenger my lord my lord the french have gathered head the dauphin with one joan la pucelle joined a holy prophetess new risen up is come with great power to raise the siege here salisbury lifteth himself up and groans here here how dying salisbury doth groan it irks his heart he cannot be revenged frenchman i'll be a salisbury to you pucelle or puzzle dauphin or dogfish your hearts will stamp out with my horse's heels and make a quagmire of your mingled brains convey me salisbury into his tent and then we'll try what these dusted frenchmen dare alarum exeunt scene five the same here an alarum again and talbot pursueth the dauphin and driveth him then enter joan la pucelle driving Englishmen before her, and exit after them, then re-enter Talbot. Where is my strength, my valour, and my force? Our English troops retire. I cannot stay them. A woman clad in armour chaseth them. Re-enter Joan La Pucelle. Here, here she comes. I'll have a bout with thee. Devil, for devil's dam I'll conjure thee. Blood will I draw on thee thou art a witch and straightway give thy soul to him thou servest come come tis only i that must disgrace thee here they fight heavens can you suffer hell so to prevail my breast i'll burst with straining of my courage and from my shoulders crack my arms asunder but i will chastise this high-minded strumpet they fight again Talbot farewell thy hour is not yet come i must go victor orleans forthwith a short alarum then enter the town with soldiers oh, take me if thou canst i scorn thy strength go go cheer up thy hungry starved man help salisbury to make his testament this day is ours as many more shall be exit my thoughts are weird like a potter's wheel I know not where I am, nor what I do. A witch, by fear, not force, like Hannibal, drives back our troops and conquers as she lists. So bees with smoke and doves with noisome stench are from their hives and houses driven away. They called us for our fierceness English dogs. Now, like to whelps, we crying run away. A short alarum. Our countrymen, I'll renew the fight or tear the lions out of england's coat renounce your soil give sheep in lion's stead sheep run not so half so treacherous from the wolf or horse or oxen from the leopard as you fly from your oft subdued slaves alarum here another skirmish it will not be retire into your trenches you all consented unto salisbury's death for none would strike a stroke in his revenge Pucelle is entered into Orléans, in spite of us, or aught that we could do. Oh, were I to die with Salisbury, the shame hereof will make me hide my head. Exit Talbot, alarum, retreat, flourish. Scene six, the same. Enter on the walls, Joan La Pucelle, Charles, Rainier, Alençon, and soldiers advance our waving colors on the walls rescue this orleans from the english thus joan la pucelle has performed her word divinest creature astraea's daughter how shall i honor thee for this success thy promises are like adonis gardens that one day bloomed and fruitful were the next france triumph in thy glorious prophetess recovered is the town of orleans 
More blessed hap did ne'er befall our state. Why ring not out the bells aloud throughout the town? Dauphin, command the citizens, make bonfires and feast and banquet in the open streets to celebrate the joy that God hath given us. All France will be replete with mirth and joy when they shall hear how we have played the men. Tis Joan, not we, by whom the day is won, for which I will divide my crown with her, and all the priests and friars in my realm shall in procession sing her endless praise. A statelier pyramus to her I'll rear than Rodolph's or Memphis ever was. In memory of her when she is dead, her ashes in an urn more precious than their rich jeweled of Darius, transported shall be at high festivals before the kings and queens of France. No longer on Saint Denis will we cry, but Joan, la Pucella, shall be France's saint. Come in, and let us banquet royally after this golden day of victory. Flourish, exalt. End of Act One. Act Two of Henry the Sixth, Part One by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One, Before Orleans. Enter a sergeant of a band with two senators. Sirs, take your places and be vigilant. If any noise or soldier you perceive near to the walls, by some apparent sign let us have knowledge at the court of guard. Sergeant, you shall. Exit Sergeant. Thus our poor servitors, when others sleep upon their quiet beds, constrain to watch in darkness, rain, and cold. Enter Talbot, Bedford, Burgundy, and forces, with scaling ladders, their drums beat a dead march. Lord Regent! and redoubted Burgundy, by whose approach the regions of Artois, Wallon, and Picardy are friends to us. This happy night the Frenchmen are secure, having all day caroused and banqueted. Embrace we then this opportunity, as fitting best acquittance their deceit, contrived by art and baleful sorcery. Coward of France, how much he wrongs his fame, despairing of his own arm's fortitude, to join with witches and the help of hell. Traitors have never other company. But what's that Purcell of whom they term so pure? A maid, they say. A maid? And be so martial. Pray God she prove not masculine ere long, if underneath the standard of the French she carry armour as she hath begun. Well, let them practise and converse with spirits. God is our fortress, in whose conquering name let us resolve to scale a flinty bulwarks. Ascend, brave Talbot, we will follow thee. Not all together, better far, I guess, that we do make our entrance several ways. That, if a chance the one of us do fail, the other yet may rise against their force. Agreed. I'll to yond corner. And I to this. And here will Talbot mount, or make his grave. Now, Salisbury, for thee, and for the right of English Henry, shall this night appear, how much in duty I am bound to both. Arm, arm, arm. the, the enemy, enemy doth, doth make, make assault. assault. Cry, St. George, a Talbot. The French leap over the walls in their shirts. Enter, several ways, the Bastard of Orleans, Alencion, and Rainier. Half ready and half unready. How now, my lords? What, all unready so? Unready, ay, and glad we scaped so well. T'was time I trow to wake and leave our beds, hearing all our rooms at our chamber doors. Of all exploits since first I followed arms, ne'er heard I of a warlike enterprise more venturous or desperate than this. I think this Talbot be a fiend of hell. If not of hell, the heavens sure favour him. Here cometh Charles, I marvel how he sped. Tut! Holy John was his defensive guard. Enter Charles and Joan La Pucelle. Is this thy cunning, thou deceitful dame? Didst thou at first to flatter us withal, 
make us partakers of a little gain that now our loss might be ten times so much wherefore is charles impatient with his friend at all times will you have my power alike sleeping or waking must i still prevail or will you blame and lay the fault on me improvident soldiers had your watch been good this sudden mischief never could have fallen duke of alencon this was your default that being captain of the watch to-night did look no better to that weighty charge at all your quarters but as safely kept as that whereof i had the government we had not been thus shamefully surprised mine was secure and so was mine my lord and for myself most part of all this night within her quarter and mine own precinct i was employed in passing to and fro about relieving of the sentinels then how or which way should they first break in question my lords no further of the case how or which way tis sure they found some place but weakly guarded where the breach was made and now there rests no other shift but this to gather our soldiers scattered and dispersed and lay new platforms to endamage them alarum enter an english soldier crying a talbot a talbot they fly leaving their clothes behind i'll be so bold to take what they have left the cry of talbot serves me for a sword for i have loaden me with many spoils using no other weapon but his name exit scene two orleans within the town enter talbot bedford burgundy a captain and others the day begins to break and night is fled whose pitchy mantle overveiled the earth here sound retreat and cease our hot pursuit retreat sounded bring forth the body of old salisbury and here advance it in the market place the middle centre of this cursed town now have i paid my vow unto his soul for every drop of blood was drawn from him there hath at least five frenchmen died to-night and that hereafter ages may behold what ruin happened in revenge of him within the chiefest temple i'll erect the tomb wherein his corpse shall be interred upon the which that ever one may read shall be engraved the sack of orleans the treacherous manner of his mournful death and what a terror he had been to france but lords in all our bloody massacre our muse we met not with the dauphin's grace his new-found champion virtuous john of arc nor any of his false confederates. Tis thought, Lord Talbot, when the fight began, roused on the sudden from their drowsy beds, they did amongst the troops of armed men leap o'er the walls for refuge in the field. Myself, as far as I could well discern for smoke and dusky vapours of the night, am sure I scared the dolphin and his trull, when arm in arm they both came swiftly running, like to a pair of loving turtle-doves that could not live a Sunday day or night. After that things are set in order here. We'll follow them with all the power we have. Enter a messenger. All hail, my lords. Which of this princely train call ye the warlike Talbot, for his act so much applauded through the realm of France? Here is the Talbot. Who would speak with him? The virtuous lady, Countess of Auvergne, with modesty admiring thy renown, by me entreats, great lord, thou wouldst vouchsafe to visit her poor castle where she lies, that she may boast she hath beheld the man whose glory fills the world with loud report. Is it even so? Nay, then, I see our wars will turn into a peaceful comic sport, when ladies crave to be encountered with. You may not, my lord, despise her gentle suit. Nay, trust me, then, for when a world of men could not prevail with all their oratory, yet hath a woman's kindness overruled and therefore tell her i return great thanks and in submission will attend on her will not your honours bear me company no truly it is more than manners will and i have heard it said unbidden guests are often welcomest when they are gone well then alone since there's no remedy i mean to prove this lady's courtesy come hither captain whispers you perceive my mind i do my lord and mean accordingly 
Exempt. Scene three. Avernier. The Countess's castle. Enter the Countess and her porter. Porter, remember what I gave in charge, and when you have done so, bring the keys to me. Madam, I will. Exit. The plot is laid. If all things fall out right, I shall as famous be by this exploit as Scythian Tomris by Cyrus's death. Great is the rumor of this dreadful night, and his achievements of no less account. Fain would mine eyes be witnessed with mine ears to give their censure of these rare reports. Enter messenger and Talbot. Madam, according as your ladyship desired by message craved, so is Lord Talbot come. And he is welcome. What? Is this the man? Madam, it is. Is this the scourge of France? Is this the Talbot so much feared abroad, that with his name the mothers still their babes? I see report as fabulous and false. I thought I should have seen some Hercules, a second Hector, for his grim aspect, and large proportions of his strong-knit limbs. Alas, this is a child, a silly dwarf. It cannot be this weak and riddled shrimp should strike such terror to his enemies. Madam, I have been bold to trouble you, but since your ladyship is not at leisure, I'll sort some other time to visit you. What means he now? Go ask him whither he goes. Stay, my lord Talbot, for my lady craves to know the cause of your abrupt departure. Marry, for that she's in a wrong belief, or I go to certify her Talbot's here. Re-enter Porter with Keys. If thou be he, then art thou prisoner. Prisoner? To whom? To me, bloodthirsty lord, and for that cause I train thee to my house. Long time thy shadow hath been thrall to me, for in my gallery thy picture hangs. But now the substance shall endure the like, and I will chain these legs and arms of thine, that hast by tyranny these many years, wasted our country, slain our citizens, and sent our sons and husbands captivate. <laughs> Laughest thou, wretch, thy mirth shall turn to moan. I laugh to see your ladyship so fond, to think that you have aught but Talbot's shadow, whereon to practice your severity. Why, art not thou the man? I am indeed. Then have I substance, too? No, no, I am but the shadow of myself. You are deceived, my substance is not here, for what you see is but the smallest part and least proportion of humanity. I tell you, madam, were the whole frame here, it is of such spacious, lofty pitch, your roof were not sufficient to contain it. This is a riddling merchant for the nonce. He will be here, and yet he is not here. How can these contrarieties agree? That will I show you presently. Winds his horn. Drums strike up, a peal of ordnance. Enter soldiers. I'll see you, madam. Are you now persuaded that Talbot is but shadow of himself? These are his substance, sinews, arms, and strength with which he yoketh your rebellious necks, raiseth your cities, and subverts your towns, and in a moment makes them desolate. Victorious Talbot, pardon my abuse. I find thou art no less than fame hath bruited, and more than may be gathered by thy shape. Let my presumption not provoke thy wrath, for I am sorry that with reverence I did not entertain thee as thou art. Be not dismayed, fair lady, nor misconstrue, the mind of Talbot, as you did mistake the outward composition of his body. What you have done hath not offended me, no other satisfaction do I crave, but only with your patience that we may taste of your wine and see what cakes you have, for soldiers' stomachs always serve them well. With all my heart, and think me honoured to feast so great a warrior in my house. Exalt. Scene four, London, the Temple Garden. Enter the Earls of Somerset, Suffolk, and Warwick, Richard Plantagenet, Vernon, and another lawyer. Great lords and gentlemen, what means this silence? Dare no man answer in a case of truth. Within the temple wall we were too loud. The garden here is more convenient. Then say at once, if I maintained the truth, or else was wrangling Somerset in the error. Faith, I have been a truant in the law and never yet could frame my will to it. 
and therefore frame the law unto my will. Judge you, my lord of Warwick, then between us. Between two hawks, which flies the higher pitch? Between two dogs, which hath the deeper mouth? Between two blades, which bears the better temper? Between two horses, which doth bear him best? Between two girls, which hath the merriest eye? I have perhaps some shallow spirit of judgment, but in these nice sharp quillets of the law, good faith, I am no wiser than a daw. Tut, tut, here is a mannerly forbearance. The truth appears so naked on my side that any purblind eye may find it out. And on my side it is so well apparelled, so clear, so shining, and so evident that it will glimmer through a blind man's eye. Since you are tongue-tied and so loath to speak, in dumb significance proclaim your thoughts. Let him that is a true-born gentleman, and stands upon the honour of his birth, if he suppose that I have pleaded truth, from off this briar pluck a white rose with me. Let him that is no coward nor no flatterer, but dare maintain the party of the truth, pluck a red rose from off this thorn with me. I love no colours and without all colour of base insinuating flattery, I pluck this white rose with Plantagenet. I pluck this red rose with young Somerset, and say with all I think he held the right. Stay, lords and gentlemen, and pluck no more, till you conclude that he upon whose side the fewest roses are cropped from the tree shall yield the other in the right opinion. Good Master Vernon, it is well objected. If I have fewest, I subscribe in silence. And I. Then, for the truth and plainness of the case, I pluck this pale and maiden blossom here, giving my verdict on the white rose side. Prick not your finger as you pluck it off, lest bleeding you do paint the white rose red, and fall on my side so against your will. If I, my lord, for my opinion bleed, opinion shall be surgeon to my hurt, and keep me on the side where still I am. Well, well, come on, who else? Unless my study and my books be false, the argument to be held was wrong in you. To Somerset. In sign whereof, I pluck a white rose, too. Now, Somerset, where is your argument? Here in my scabbard, meditating, that shall dye your white rose in a bloody red. Meantime, your cheeks do counterfeit our roses, for pale they look with fear as witnessing the truth on our side. No, Plantagenet, tis not for fear, but anger thy cheeks blush for pure shame to counterfeit our roses, and yet thy tongue will not confess thy error. Hath not thy rose a canker, Somerset? Hath not thy rose a thorn, Plantagenet? I, sharp and piercing, to maintain his truth, whilst thy consuming canker eats his falsehood. Well, I'll find friends to wear my bleeding roses that shall maintain what I have said is true, where false Plantagenet dare not be seen. Now by this maiden blossom in my hand I scorn thee and thy fashion, peevish boy. Tear not thy scorns this way, Plantagenet. Proud Pole, I will, and scorn both him and thee. I'll turn my part thereof into thy throat. Away, away, good William de la Pole. We grace the yeoman by conversing with him. Now, by God's will, thou wrongest him, Somerset. His grandfather was Lionel, Duke of Clarence, third son to the third Edward, King of England. Spring crestless yeoman from so deep a root? He bears him on the place's privilege, or durst not for his craven heart say thus. By him that made me, I'll maintain my words on any plot of ground in Christendom. Was not thy father, Richard Earl of Cambridge, for treason executed in our late king's days? And by his treason stand'st not thou attained, corrupted and exempt from ancient gentry? His trespass yet lives guiltly in thy blood, and till thou be restored, thou art a yeoman. My father was attached, not attainted, condemned to die for treason, but no traitor, and that I'll prove on better men than Somerset were growing time once ripened to my will. For your partaker pole, and you yourself, I'll note you in my book of memory to scourge you for this apprehension. Look to it well, and say you are well warned. 
Ah, thou shalt find us ready for thee still, and knowest by these colors for thy foes, for these, my friends, in spite of thee, shall wear. And by my soul, this pale and angry rose, as cognizance of my blood-drinking hate, will I forever and my faction wear, until it wither with me to my grave, or flourish to the height of my degree. Go forward and be choked with thy ambition, and so farewell until I meet thee next. Exit. Have with thee, Pole. Farewell, ambitious Richard. Exit. How I am braved, and must perforce endure it. This blot that they object against your house shall be wiped out in the next Parliament called for the truce of Winchester and Gloucester. And if thou be not then created York, I will not live to be accounted Warwick. Meantime, in signal of my love to thee, against proud Somerset and William Pole, will I upon thy party wear this rose. And here I prophesy, this brawl to-day, grown to this faction in the temple garden, shall send between the red rose and the white a thousand souls to death and deadly night. Good Master Vernon, I am bound to you, that you on my behalf would pluck a flower. In your behalf, still, I will wear the same. And so will I. Thanks, gentle sir. Come, let us for to dinner. I dare say this quarrel will drink blood another day. Exeunt. Scene five, the Tower of London. Enter Mortimer, brought in a chair, and jailers. Kind keepers of my weak decaying age, let dying Mortimer here rest himself. Even like a man new haled from the rack, so fare my limbs with long imprisonment. And these gray locks, the pursuivants of death, nestor like aged in an age of care argue the end of edmund mortimer these eyes like lamps whose wasting oil is spent wax dim as drawing to their exigent weak shoulders overborne with burthening grief and pithless arms like to a withered vine that droops his sapless branches to the ground yet are these feet whose strengthless stay is numb unable to support this lump of clay swift winged with desire to get a grave as witting i no other comfort have but tell me keeper will my nephew come richard plantagenet my lord will come we sent him to the temple and to his chamber an answer was returned that he will come enough my soul shall then be satisfied poor gentleman his wrong doth equal mine since henry monmouth first began to reign before whose glory i was great in arms this loathsome sequestration have i had and even since then hath richard been obscured deprived of honour and inheritance but now the arbitrator of despairs just death kind umpire of men's miseries with sweet enlargement doth dismiss me hence i would his troubles likewise were expired that so he might recover what was lost enter richard plantagenet my lord your loving nephew now is come richard plantagenet my friend is he come ay noble uncle thus ignobly used your nephew, late despised Richard, comes. Direct mine arms I may embrace his neck, And in his bosom spend my latter gasp. Oh, tell me when my lips do touch his cheeks, That I may kindly give one fainting kiss. And now declare, sweet stem from York's great stock, Why didst thou say, of late thou wert despised? First lean thine aged back against mine arm, And, in that ease, I'll tell thee my dis-ease. This day, in argument upon a case, Some words there grew twixt Somerset and me, Among which terms he used his lavish tongue, And did upbraid me with my father's death, Which obloquy set bars before my tongue, Else with the like I had requited him. Therefore, good uncle, for my father's sake, in honour of a true Plantagenet, and for alliance's sake, declare the cause my father, Earl of Cambridge, lost his head. 
That cause, fair nephew, that imprisoned me, and hath detained me all my flowering youth within a loathsome dungeon there to pine, was cursed instrument of his decease. Discover more at large what cause that was, for I am ignorant and cannot guess. I will, if that my fading breath permit, and death approach not ere my tale be done. Henry the Fourth, grandfather to this king, deposed his nephew Richard, Edward's son, the first begotten and the lawful heir of Edward King, the third of that descent, during whose reign the Percies of the North, finding his usurpation most unjust, endeavoured my advancement to the throne. The reason moved these warlike lords to this was, for that, young King Richard thus removed, leaving no heir begotten of his body, I was the next by birth and parentage, for by my mother I derived am from Lionel, Duke of Clarence, the third son to King Edward the Third, whereas he from John of Gaunt doth bring his pedigree, being but fourth of that heroic line. But, Mark, as in this haughty attempt they laboured to plant the rightful heir, I lost my liberty, and they their lives. Long after this, when Henry V, succeeding his father Bolingbroke, did reign, thy father, Earl of Cambridge, then derived from famous Edmund Langley, Duke of York, marrying my sister, that thy mother was, again in pity of my hard distress, levied an army, weaning to redeem, and have installed me in the diadem. But, as the rest, so fell that noble earl, and was beheaded. Thus the Mortimers, in whom the tide rested, were suppressed. Of which, my lord, your honour is the last. True and thou seest that I no issue have, and that my fainting words do warrant death. Thou art my heir, the rest I wish thee gather. But yet be wary in thy studious care. Thy grave admonishments prevail with me, but yet, methinks, my father's execution was nothing less than bloody tyranny. With silence, nephew, be thou politic strong fixed is the house of lancaster and like a mountain not to be removed but now thy uncle is removing hence as princes do their courts when they are cloyed with long continuance in a settled place o oh, uncle would some part of my young years might but redeem the passage of your age thou dost then wrong me as that slaughterer doth which giveth many wounds when one will kill mourn not except thou sorrow for my good only give order for my funeral and so farewell and fair be all thy hopes and prosperous be thy life in peace and war dies and peace, no war, befall thy parting soul. In prison hast thou spent a pilgrimage, And like a hermit overpassed thy days. Well, I will lock his counsel in my breast, And what I do imagine let that rest. Keepers, convey him hence, And I myself will see his burial better than his life. Exeunt jailers, bearing out the body of Mortimer. Here dies the dusky torch of Mortimer, choked with ambition of the meaner sort, and for those wrongs, those bitter injuries, which Somerset hath offered to my house, I doubt not but with honour to redress, and therefore haste I to the Parliament, either to be restored to my blood, or make my ill the advantage of my good. Exit. End of Act Two Act Three of Henry the Sixth, Part One, by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One, London, the Parliament House, Flourish. Enter King Henry the Sixth, Exeter, 
Gloucester, Warwick, Somerset, and Suffolk, the Bishop of Winchester, Richard Plantagenet, and others. Gloucester offers to put up a bill. Bishop of Winchester snatches it and tears it. Comest thou with deep premeditated lines, with written pamphlets studiously devised, Humphrey of Gloucester? If thou canst accuse, or aught intendest to lay unto my charge, do it without invention, suddenly, as I with sudden and extemporal speech purpose to answer what thou canst object. Presumptuous priest, this place commands my patience, or thou shouldst find thou hast dishonoured me. Think not, although in writing I preferred the manner of thy vile outrageous crimes, that therefore I have forged or am not able verbatim to rehearse the method of my pen. No, prelate, such is thy audacious wickedness, thy lewd, pestiferous, and dissentious pranks, as very infants prattle of thy pride. Thou art a most pernicious usurer, forward by nature enemy to peace, lascivious, wanton, more than well beseems a man of thy profession and degree, and for thy treachery, what's more manifest, in that thou laidst a trap to take my life, as well at London Bridge as at the Tower. Beside, I fear me, if thy thoughts were sifted, the king, thy sovereign, is not quite exempt from envious malice of thy swelling heart. Gloucester, I do defy thee, Lords, vouchsafe to give me hearing what I shall reply. If I were covetous, ambitious, or perverse, as he will have me, how am I so poor? And how haps it I seek not to advance or raise myself, but keep my wonted calling? And for dissension, who prefereth peace more than I do, except I be provoked? No, my good lords, it is not that offends, it is not that that hath incensed the duke, it is because no one should sway but he, no one but he should be about the king, and that engenders thunder in his breast, and makes him roar these accusations forth. But he shall know I am as good as good, thou bastard of my grandfather. Ay, lordly sir, for what are you, I pray, but one imperious in another's throne? Am I not protector, saucy priest? And am not I a prelate of the church? Yes, as an outlaw in a castle keeps and useth it to patronage his theft. Unreverent Gloucester. Thou art reverent, touching thy spiritual function, not thy life. Rome shall remedy this. Rome thither, then. My lord, it were your duty to forbear. Ay, see the bishop be not overborne. Methinks my lord should be religious, and know the office that belongs to such. Methinks his lordship should be humbler. It fitteth not a prelate so to plead. Yes when his holy state is touched so near. State holy or unhallowed, what of that? Is not his grace protector to the king? Aside. Plantagenet, I see, must hold his tongue, lest it be said, Speak, sir, a when you should. Must your bold verdict enter talk with lords? Else would I have a fling at Winchester. Uncles of Gloucester and of Winchester, the special watchman of our English wheel, I would prevail, if prayers might prevail, to join your hearts in love and amity. Oh, what a scandal is it to our crown, that two such noble peers as ye should jar! Believe me, lords, my tender years can tell civil dissension is a viprous worm that gnaws the bowels of the commonwealth. A noise within. Down with the tawny coats. What tumult's this? An uproar, I dare warrant, begun through malice of the bishop's men. A noise again. Stones, stones. Enter Mayor. Oh, my good lords, and virtuous Henry, pity the city of London, pity us. The bishop and the Duke of Gloucester's men, forbidden late to carry any weapon, have filled their pockets full of pebble-stones, and banding themselves in contrary parts, do pelt so fast at one another's pate, that many have their giddy brains knocked out. Our windows are broke down in every street, and we for fear compelled to shut our shops. Enter serving men, in skirmish, with bloody pates. We charge you, on allegiance to ourself, to hold your slaughtering hands and keep the peace. 
Pray, Uncle Gloucester, mitigate this strife. Nay, if we be forbidden stones, we'll fall to it with our teeth. Do what ye dare. We are as resolute. Skirmish again. You of my household leave this peevish broil, and set this unaccustomed fight aside. My lord, we know your grace to be a man just and upright, and for your royal birth inferior to none but to his majesty. And ere that we will suffer such a prince, so kind a father of the commonweal, to be disgraced by an inkhorn mate, we and our wives and children all will fight and have our bodies slaughtered by thy foes. Ay, and the very parings of our nails shall pitch a field when we are dead. Begin again. Stay, stay, I say, and if you love me, as you say you do, let me persuade you to forbear a while. Oh, how this discord doth afflict my soul! Can you, my lord of Winchester, behold my sighs and tears, and will not once relent? Who should be pitiful if you be not? Or who should study to prefer a peace if holy churchmen take delight in broils? Yield, my lord protector, yield, Winchester, except you mean with obstinate repulse to slay your sovereign and destroy the realm. You see what mischief and what murder, too, hath been enacted through your enmity. Then be at peace, except ye thirst for blood. He shall submit, or I will never yield. Compassion on the king commands me stoop, or I would see his heart out, ere the priest should ever get that privilege of me. Behold, my lord of Winchester, the duke hath banished moody, discontented fury, as by his smooth brows it doth appear. Why look you still so stern and tragical? Here, Winchester, I offer thee my hand. Fie, Uncle Beaufort! I have heard you preach that malice was a great and grievous sin. And will you not maintain the thing you teach, but prove a chief offender in the same? Sweet king, the bishop hath a kindly gird. For shame, my lord of Winchester, relent! What, shall a child instruct you what to do? Well, Duke of Gloucester, I will yield to thee. Love for thy love, and hand for hand I give. Aside. Ay, but I fame me with a hollow heart. See here, my friends and loving countrymen, this token serveth for a flag of truce betwixt ourselves and all our followers. So help me God, as I dissemble not. Aside. So help me God, as I intend it not. O oh, loving uncle, kind Duke of Gloucester, how joyful am I made by this contract! Away, my masters, trouble us no more, but join in friendship as your lords have done. Content. I'll to the surgeons. And so will I, and I will see what physic the tavern affords. Exeunt. Serving men, mayor, etc. Accept this scroll, most gracious sovereign, which in the right of Richard Plantagenet we do exhibit to your majesty. Well urged, my lord of Warwick, or oh, sweet prince, and if your grace mark every circumstance, you have great reason to do Richard right, especially for those occasions at Eltham Place, I told your majesty. And those occasions, uncle, were of force. Therefore, my loving lords, our pleasure is that Richard be restored to his blood. Let Richard be restored to his blood, so shall his father's wrongs be recompensed. As will the rest, so willeth Winchester. If Richard will be true, not that alone, but all the whole inheritance I give that doth belong unto the house of York, from whence you spring by lineal descent. Thy humble servant vows obedience and humble service till the point of death. Stoop then, and set your knee against my foot, and in regurden of that duty done, I gird thee with the valiant sword of York. Rise, Richard, like a true Plantagenet, and rise created princely Duke of York. And so thrive, Richard, as thy foes may fall, and as my duty springs, so perish they that grudge one thought against your majesty. Welcome, High, High Prince, Prince, the mighty Duke, Duke of, York. of York. Aside. Perish, base Prince, ignoble Duke of York. Now will it best avail your majesty to cross the seas, and to be crowned in France. The presence of a king engenders love amongst his subjects and his loyal friends, as it disanimates his enemies. When Gloucester says the word, King Henry goes, for friendly counsel cuts off many foes. Your ships already are in readiness. Senate, flourish, exeunt, all but Exeter. Ay, we may march in England or in France, not seeing what is likely to ensue. This late dissension, grown betwixt the peers, burns under faint ashid of forged love, and will at last break out into a flame. 
as festered members rot but by degree till bones and flesh and sinews fall away so will this base and envious discord breed and now i fear that fatal prophecy which in the time of henry named the fifth was in the mouth of every sucking babe that henry born at monmouth should win all and henry born at windsor lose all which is so plain that exeter doth wish his days may finish ere that hapless time exit scene two france before rowan enter jean la pucelle disguised with four soldiers with sacks upon their backs these are the city gates the gates of rouen through which our policy must make a breach take heed be wary how you place your words talk like the vulgar sort of market men that come to gather money for their corn if we have entrance as i hope we shall and that we find the slothful watch but weak i'll by a sign give notice to our friends that charles the dauphin may encounter them our sacks shall be a mean to sack the city and we be lords and rulers over ruin therefore we'll knock knocks within qui est là paysans pauvres gens de france poor market folks that come to sell their corn enter go in the market bell is rung now rouen i'll shake their bulwarks to the ground Exeunt. Enter Charles, the bastard of Orleans, Alencion, Rainier, and forces. Saint Denis bless this happy stratagem, and once again we we'll sleep secure in Rouen. Here entered Pucel and her practison. Now she is there. How will she specify where is the best and safest passage in? By thrusting out a torch from yonder tower, which once discerned shows that her meaning is no way to that for weakness which she entered enter joan la pucelle on the top thrusting out a torch burning behold this is the happy wedding torch that joineth rouen unto her countrymen but burning fatal to the talbotites exit see noble charles the beacon of our friend the burning torch in yonder turret stands now shine it like a comet of revenge, a prophet to the fall of all our foes. Defer no time, delays have dangerous ends. Enter and cry, the Dauphin presently, and then do execution on the watch. Alarum. Exeunt. An alarum. Enter Talbot in an excursion. France, thou shalt rue this treason with thy tears. If Talbot but survive thy treachery. Purcell, that witch, that damned sorceress, hath wrought this hellish mischief unawares that hardly we escape the pride of France. Exit. An alarum. Excursions. Bedford, brought in sick in a chair. Enter Talbot and Burgundy without. Within. Joan la Pucelle, Charles, bastard of Orleans, Alencion and Rainier on the walls. Good morrow, gallants. Want ye come for bread? I think the Duke of Burgundy will fast before he'll buy again at such a rate. Twas full of tarnel. Do you like the taste? Scoff on, vile fiend and shameless courtesan. I trust ere long to choke thee with thine own and make thee curse the harvest of that corn. Your grace may starve perhaps before that time. Oh, let no words but deeds revenge this treason. What will you do, good greybeard? Break a lance and run a tilt at death within a chair? Thou fiend of France, and hag of all despite, encompassed with thy lustful paramours, becomes it thee to taunt his valiant age, and twit with cowardice a man half dead? Damsel, I live about with thee again, or else let Talbot perish with the shame. Are you so hot, sir? Yet, Pucelle, hold thy peace. If Talbot do but thunder, rain will follow. The English whisper together in council. God speed the parliament. Who shall be the speaker? Dare he come forth and meet us in the field? Belike your lordship takes us then for fools to try if that our own be ours or no. I speak not to that railing Hecate but unto thee, Alençon, and the rest, will ye, like soldiers, 
come and fight it out? Signor, no. Signor, hang base muleteers of France. Like peasant footboys do they keep the walls and dare not take up arms like gentlemen. Away, captains. Let's get us from the walls. For Talbot means no goodness by his looks. God be with you, my lord. We came but to tell you that we are here. Exeunt from the walls. And there will we be too, ere it be long, or else reproach be Talbot's greatest fame. Thou, Burgundy, by honour of thou house, pricked on by public wrongs sustained in France, either to get the town again, or die. And I, as sure as English Henry lives, and as his father here was conqueror, as sure as in this late betrayed town, great Coeur de Lyon's heart was buried, so sure I swear to get the town, or die. My vows are equal partners with thy vows. But ere we go, regard this dying prince, the valiant Duke of Bedford. Come, my lord, we will bestow in some better place, fit for sickness and for crazy age. Lord Talbot, do not so dishonour me. Here will I sit before the walls of Rouen, and will be partner of your weal or woe. Courageous Bedford, let us now persuade you. Not to be gone from hence. For once I read that stout Pendragon and his litter sick came to the field and vanquished his foes. Methinks I should revive the soldiers' hearts, because I ever found them as myself. Undaunted spirit in a dying breast, then be it so. Heavens keep old Bedford safe. And now, no more ado, brave Burgundy, but gather we our forces out of hand and set upon our boasting enemy. Exeunt all but Bedford and attendants, an alarum, excursions. Enter Fastolf and a captain. Whither away, Sir John Fastolf, in such haste? Whither away to save myself by flight? We are like to have the overthrow again. What? Will you fly and leave, Lord Talbot? Aye, all the Talbots in the world to save my life. Exit. Cowardly knight, ill fortune follow thee. Exit. Retreat, excursions. Joan La Pucelle, Alencon, and Charles fly. Now, quiet soul, depart when heaven please, for I have seen our enemies overthrow. What is the trust or strength of foolish man? They that of late were daring with their scoffs are glad and fain by flight to save themselves. Bedford dies and is carried in by two in his chair. An alarum. Re enter Talbot. Burgundy, and the rest. Lost, and recovered in a day again. This is a double honour, Burgundy, yet heavens have glory for this victory. Warlike and martial, Talbot, Burgundy enshrines thee in his heart, and there erects thy noble deeds as valour's monuments. Thanks, gentle duke. But where is Pucel now? I think her old familiar is asleep. Now, where's the bastard's braves? And Charles his gleeks. What? All amour? Rouen hangs her head for grief that such a valiant company are fled. Now will we take some order in the town, placing therein some expert officers, and then depart to Paris to the king, for there young Henry with his nobles lie. What wills Lord Talbot pleaseth Burgundy? But yet, before we go, Let's not forget the noble Duke of Bedford, late deceased, but see his exequies fulfilled in Rouen. A braver soldier never couched lance, a gentler heart did never sway in court, but kings and mightiest potentates must die, for that's the end of human misery. Exeunt. Scene three. The plains near Rouen. Enter Charles, the bastard of Orleans, Alencon. Joan La Pucelle and forces. Dismay not, princess, at this accident, nor grieve that Rouen is so recovered. Care is no cure, but rather corrosive, for things that are not to be remedied. Let frantic Talbot triumph for a while, and like a peacock sweep along his tail. We'll pull his plumes and take away his train, if Dauphin and the rest will be but ruled. We have been guided by thee hitherto, and of thy cunning had no diffidence. 
One sudden foil shall never breed distrust. Search out thy wit for secret policies, and we will make thee famous through the world. We'll set thy statue in some holy place, and have thee reverenced like a blessed saint. Employ thee then, sweet virgin, for our good. Then, thus it must be. This doth drone device. By fair persuasions mixed with sugared words, we will entice the Duke of Burgundy to leave the Talbot and to follow us. Ay, Mary, sweeting, if we could do that, France were no place for Henri's warriors. Nor should that nation boast its soul with us, but be extirped from our provinces. For ever should they be expulsed from France, and not have title of an earldom here. Your honours shall perceive how I will work to bring this matter to the wished end. Drum sounds afar off. Hark! By the sound of drum you may perceive their powers are marching unto Paris ward. Hear sound an English march. Enter and pass over at a distance. Talbot and his forces. There goes the Talbot, with his colours spread, and all the troops of English after him. French march. Enter Burgundy and forces. Now in the rear world comes the Duke and his. Fortune in favour makes him lag behind. Summon a parley. We will talk with him. Trumpets sound a parley. A parley with the Duke of Burgundy. Who craves a parley with the Burgundy? The princely Charles of France, thy countryman. What sayest thou, Charles? For I am marching hence. Speak, Pusella, and enchant him with thy words. Brave Burgundy, undoubted hope of France. Stay, let thy humble handmaid speak to thee. Speak on, but be not over tedious. Look on thy country, look on fertile France, and see the cities and the towns defaced by wasting ruin of the cruel foe. As looks the mother on her lowly babe, when death doth close his tender dying eyes, see, see the pining melody of France. Behold the wounds, the most unnatural wounds, which thou thyself hast given her woeful breast. Oh, turn thy edged sword another way. Strike those that hurt, and hurt not those that help. One drop of blood, drawn from thy country's bosom, should grieve thee more than streams of foreign gore. Return thee, therefore, with a flood of tears, and wash away thy country's stained spots. Either she hath bewitched me with her words, or nature makes me suddenly relent. Besides, all French and friends exclaims on thee, doubting thy birth and lawful progeny. Who jointest thou with but with a lordly nation, that will not trust thee but for profit's sake? When Talbot hath set footing once in France, and fashioned thee that instrument of ill, who then but English Henry will be lord, and thou be thrust out like a fugitive? Call we to mind, and mark but this for proof. Was not the Duke of Orleans thy foe? And was he not in England prisoner? But when they heard he was thine enemy, they set him free without his ransom paid, in spite of Burgundy and all his friends. See, then, thou fightest against thy countrymen, and joinst us with them will be thy slaughtermen. Come, come, return, return, thou wandering lord. Charles and the rest will take thee in their arms. I am vanquished. These haughty words of hers have butted me like roaring cannon shot, and made me almost yield upon my knees. Forgive me, country, and sweet countrymen, and lords, Accept this hearty kind embrace. My forces and my power of men are yours. So farewell, Talbot. I'll no longer trust thee. Aside. Done like a Frenchman. Turn, and turn again. Welcome, brave Duke. Thy friendship makes us fresh. And dost beget new courage in our breasts. Fusel hath bravely played her part in this, and doth deserve a coronet of gold. Now let us on, my lords, and join our powers, and seek how we may prejudice the foe. Exeunt. Scene four. Paris. The palace. Enter King Henry the Sixth, Gloucester, Bishop of Winchester, York, Suffolk, Somerset, Warwick, Exeter, Vernon. Bassett and others, to them, with his soldiers, Talbot. 
my gracious prince and honourable peers hearing of your arrival in this realm i have a while given truce unto my wars to do my duty to my sovereign in sign whereof this arm that hath reclaimed your obedience fifty fortresses twelve cities and seven walled towns of strength beside five hundred prisoners of esteem let's fall his sword before your highness feet and with submissive loyalty of heart ascribes the glory of his conquest got first to my god and next unto your grace Niels. is this the lord talbot uncle gloucester that hath so long been resident in france yes if it please your majesty my liege welcome brave captain and victorious lord when i was young as yet i am not old i do remember how my father said a stouter champion never handled sword long since we were resolved of your truth your faithful service and your toil in war yet never have you tasted our reward or been regurdened with so much as thanks because till now we never saw your face therefore stand up and for these good deserts we here create you earl of shrewsbury and in our coronation take your place senate flourish exalt all but vernon and bassett now sir to you that were so hot at sea disgracing of these colours that i wear in honour of my noble lord of york darest thou maintain the former words thou spakest yes sir as well as you dare patronage the envious barking of your saucy tongue against my lord the duke of somerset sirrah thy lord i honour as he is why what is he as good a man as york hark ye not so in witness take ye that strikes him oh, villain thou knowest the law of arms is such that whoso draws a sword tis present death or else this blow should broach thy dearest blood but i'll under his majesty and crave i may have liberty to venge this wrong when thou shalt see i'll meet thee to thy cost well miscreant i'll be there as soon as you and after meet you sooner than you would Exant. End of Act 3 Act 4 of Henry the Sixth, Part 1 by William Shakespeare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 4, Scene 1, Paris, a Hall of State. Enter King Henry the Sixth, Gloucester, Bishop of Winchester, York, Suffolk, Somerset, Warwick, Talbot, Exeter, the Governor of Paris, and others. Lord Bishop set the crown upon his head. God save King Henry, of that name the Sixth. Now, Governor of Paris, take your oath that you elect no other king but him, esteem and friends but such that are his friends, and none your foes, but such as shall pretend malicious practices against his state. This shall ye do, so help you, righteous God. Enter Fistolf. My gracious sovereign, as I rode from Calais to haste unto your coronation, a letter was delivered to my hands, writ to your grace from the Duke of Burgundy. Shame to the Duke of Burgundy, and thee, I vowed, base knight, when I did meet thee next, to tear the garter from thy craven's leg. Plucking it off. Which I have done, because unworthy thou wast installed in that high degree. Pardon me, princely Henry, and the rest, this dastard at the Battle of Pate, when but in all I was six thousand strong, and that the French were almost ten to one, before we met or that a stroke was given, like to a trusty squire, did run away, in which assault we lost twelve hundred men. Myself and divers gentlemen beside were there surprised and taken prisoners. Then judge, great lords, if I have done amiss, or whether that such cowards ought to wear this ornament of knighthood, ye or no. To say the truth, this fact was infamous, and ill-beseeming any common man. 
much more a knight to captain and a leader when first this order was ordained my lords knights of the garter were of noble birth valiant and virtuous full of haughty courage such as were grown to credit by the wars not fearing death nor shrinking for distress but always resolute in most extremes he then that is not furnished in this sort doth but usurp the sacred name of knight profaning this most honourable order and should if i were worthy to be judge be quite degraded like a hedge-born swain that doth presume to boast of gentle blood stain to thy countrymen thou hear'st thy doom be packing therefore thou that wast a knight henceforth we banish thee on pain of death exit for staff and now my lord protector view the letter sent from our uncle duke of burgundy what means his grace that he hath changed his style no more but plain and bluntly to the king hath he forgot he is his sovereign or doth this churlish superscription pretend some alteration in good will what's here reads i have upon a special cause moved with compassion of my country's wreck together with the pitiful complaints of such as your oppression feeds upon forsaken your pernicious faction and joined with charles the rightful king of france o oh, monstrous treachery can this be so that in alliance amity is an oath there should be found such false dissembling guile what doth my uncle burgundy revolt he doth my lord and has become your foe is that the worst this letter doth contain it is the worst and all my lord he writes why then lord talbot there shall talk with him and give him chastisement for this abuse how say you my lord are you not content content my liege yes but that i am prevented i should have begged i might have been employed then gather strength and march unto him straight let him perceive how ill we brook his treason and what offence it is to flout his friends i go my lord in heart desiring still you may behold confusion of your foes exit enter vernon and basset grant me the combat gracious sovereign and me my lord grant me the combat too this is my servant hear him noble prince and this is mine sweet henry favour him be patient lords and give them leave to speak say gentlemen what makes you thus exclaim and wherefore crave you combat or with whom with him my lord for he hath done me wrong and i with him for he hath done me wrong what is that wrong whereof you both complain first let me know and then i'll answer you crossing the sea from england into france this fellow here with envious carping tongue upbraided me about the rose i wear saying the sanguine colour of the leaves did represent my master's blushing cheeks when stubbornly he did repugn the truth about a certain question in the law argued betwixt the duke of york and him with other vile and ignominious terms in confutation of which rude reproach and in defence of my lord's worthiness i crave the benefit of law of arms and that is my petition noble lord for though he seen with forged quaint conceit to set a gloss upon his bold intent yet no my lord i was provoked by him and he first took exceptions at this badge pronouncing that the paleness of this flower bewayed the faintness of my master's heart will not this malice somerset be left your private grudge my lord of york will out though near so cunningly you smother it good lord what madness rules in brain-sick men when for so slight and frivolous a cause such factious emulations shall arise good cousins both of york and somerset quiet yourselves i pray and be at peace let this dissension first be tried by fight and then your highness shall command a peace the quarrel toucheth none but us alone betwixt ourselves let us decide it then there is my pledge accept it somerset nay let it rest where it began at first confirm it so mine honourable lord confirm it so confounded be your strife and perish ye with your audacious trape presumptuous vassals are you not ashamed with this immodest clamorous outrage to trouble and disturb the king and us and you my lords methinks you do not well 
to bear with their perverse objections, much less to take occasion from their mouths to raise in mutiny betwixt yourselves. Let me persuade you, take a better course. It grieves his highness. Good, my lords, be friends. Come hither, you that would be combatants. Henceforth I charge you, as you love our favour, quite to forget this quarrel and the cause. And you, my lords, remember where we are, in France, amongst a fickle, wavering nation. If they perceive dissension in our looks, and that within ourselves we disagree, how will their grudging stomachs be provoked to wilful disobedience and rebel? Besides, what infamy will there arise when foreign princes shall be certified that for a toy, a thing of no regard, King Henry's peers and chief nobility destroyed themselves and lost the realm of France? Oh, think upon the conquest of my father, my tender years, and let us not forgo that for a trifle that was bought with blood. Let me be umpire in this doubtful strife. I see no reason, if I wear this rose, putting on a red rose, that any one should therefore be suspicious I more inclined to Somerset than York. Both are my kinsmen, and I love them both. As well they may upbraid me with my crown, because forsooth the King of Scots is crowned. But your discretions better can persuade than I am able to instruct or teach. And therefore, as we hither came in peace, so let us still continue peace and love. Cousin of York, we institute your grace to be our regent in these parts of France, and, good my lord of Somerset, unite your troops of horsemen with his bands of foot, and, like true subjects, sons of your progenitors, go cheerfully together and digest your angry choler on your enemies. Ourself, my lord protector and the rest, after some respite will return to Calais, from thence to England, where I hope ere long to be presented by your victories, with Charles, Alenson, and that traitorous rout. Flourish. Exalt all but York, Warwick, Exeter, and Vernon. My lord of York, I promise you the king prettily, methought, did play the orator. And so he did, but yet I like it not, in that he wears the badge of Somerset. Tush, that was but his fancy, blame him not. I dare presume, sweet prince, he thought no harm. And if I wist he did, but let it rest. Other affairs must now be managed. Exeunt, all but Exeter. Well didst thou, Richard, to suppress thy voice? For had the passions of thy heart burst out, I fear we should have seen deciphered there more rancorous spite, more furious raging broils than yet can be imagined or supposed. But howsoe'er, no simple man that sees this jarring discord of nobility, this shouldering of each other in the court, this factious bandying of their favourites, but that it doth presage some ill event. Tis much when sceptres are in children's hands, but more when envy breeds unkind division. There comes the rain, there begins confusion. Exit. Scene two. Before Bordeaux, enter Talbot with trump and drum. Go to the house of Bordeaux, trumpeter. Summon the general unto the wall. Trumpet sounds. Enter general and others aloft. English John Talbot, captains, calls you forth. Servant in arms to Harry, king of England. And thus he would. Open your city gates. Be humble to us. Call my sovereign yours, and do him homage as obedient subjects, and I'll withdraw me and my bloody power. But if you frown upon this proffered peace, you tempt the fury of my three attendants, lean famine, quartering steel, and climbing fire, who in a moment, even with the earth, shall lay your stately and air-braving towers, if you forsake the offer of their love. Thou ominous and fearful owl of death, our nation's terror and their bloody scourge, the period of thy tyranny approacheth. On us thou canst not enter but by death. For, I protest, we are well fortified and strong enough to issue out and fight. If thou retire, the Dauphin well appointed stands with the snares of war to tangle thee. 
On either hand thee there are squadrons pitched, To wall thee from the liberty of flight, And no way canst thou turn thee for redress, But death doth front thee with apparent spoil, And pale destruction meets thee in the face. Ten thousand French have ta'en the sacrament To rive their dangerous artillery Upon no Christian soul but English Talbot. Lo, there thou stand'st, a breathing valiant man, Of an invincible unconquered spirit. This is the latest glory of thy praise, That I, thy enemy, jew thee withal. For ere the glass that now begins to run Finish the process of his sandy hour, these eyes that see thee now well coloured shall see thee withered, bloody, pale, and dead. Drum afar off. Hark, hark, the dauphin's drum, a warning bell, sings heavy music to thy timorous soul, and mine shall ring thy dire departure out. Exeunt, general, etc. He fables not. I hear the enemy. Out, the blight horsemen, and bruise their wings. Oh, negligent and heedless discipline! How are we parked and bounded in a pale, a little herd of England's timorous deer, mazed with the yelping kill of French curs? If we be English deer, be then in blood, not rascal-like to fall down with a pinch, but rather moody mad and desperate stags, turn on the bloody hounds with heads of steel, and make the cowards stand aloof at bay. Sell every man his life as dear as mine, and they shall find dear, dear of us, my friends. God and St. George, Talbot and England's right, prosper our colours in this dangerous fight. Exeunt. Scene three. Plains in Gascony. Enter a messenger that meets York. Enter York with trumpet and many soldiers. Are not the speedy scouts returned again that dogged the mighty army of the Dauphin? They are returned, my lord, and give it out that he has marched to Bordeaux with his power to fight with Talbot. As he marched along, by your espials were discovered two mightier troops than that the Dauphin led, which joined with him and made their march for Bordeaux. Plague upon that villain Somerset, that thus delays my promised supply of horsemen that were levied for this siege. Renowned Talbot doth expect my aid, and I am louted by a traitor villain, and cannot help the noble Chevalier. God comfort him in this necessity. If he miscarry, farewell wars in France. Enter Sir William Lucy. Thou princely leader of our English strength, never so needful on the earth of France, spur to the rescue of the noble Talbot, who now is girdled with a waist of iron, and hemmed about with grim destruction. To Bordeaux, warlike duke, to Bordeaux, York, else farewell Talbot, France, and England's honour. Oh, God, that Somerset, who in proud heart doth stop my cornets, were in Talbot's place. So should we save a valiant gentleman by forfeiting a traitor and a coward. Mad ire and wrathful fury makes me weep, that thus we die while remiss traitors sleep. Oh, send some succour to the distressed lord. He dies, we lose, I break my warlike word. We mourn, France smiles, we lose, they daily get, All long of this vile traitor Somerset. Then God take mercy on brave Talbot's soul, And on his son young John, who two hours since I met in travel toward his warlike father. This seven years did not Talbot see his son, And now they meet where both their lives are done. Alas, what joy shall noble Talbot have to bid his young son welcome to the grave? Away, vexation almost stops my breath, that sundered friends greet in the hour of death. Lucy, farewell, no more my fortune can, but curse the cause I cannot aid the man. Maine, Blois, Poictiers, and Tours are won away, long all of Somerset and his delay. Exit. With his soldiers. Thus, while the vulture of sedition feeds in the bosom of such great commanders, sleeping neglection doth betray to loss the conquest of our scarce cold conqueror, that ever living man of memory, Henry the Fifth, whilst they each other cross, lives, honours, lands, and all hurry to loss. Exit. Scene 4. Other Plains in Gascony. 
Enter Somerset with his army, a captain of Talbot's with him. It is too late. I cannot send them now. This expedition was by York and Talbot too rashly plotted. All our general force might with a sally of the very town be buckled with. The over-daring Talbot hath sullied all his gloss of former honor by this unheedful, desperate, wild adventure. York set him on to fight and die in shame. That Talbot dead, great York might bear the name. Here is Sir William Lucy, who with me set from our o'ermatched forces forth for aid. Enter Sir William Lucy. How now, Sir William, whither were you sent? Whither, my lord, from bought and sold Lord Talbot, who ringed about with bold adversity, cries out for noble York and Somerset to beat a sailing death from his weak legions, and whiles the honourable captain there drops bloody sweat from his war-wearied limbs, and in advantage lingering looks for rescue, you, his false hopes, the trust of England's honour, keep off aloof with worthless emulation. Let not your private discord keep away the levied succours that should lend him aid, while he, renowned noble gentleman, yields up his life unto a world of odds. Orleans the bastard Charles Burgundy, Alencon Rainier compass him about, and Talbot perisheth by your default. York said him on, York should have sent him aid. And York as fast upon your grace exclaims, swearing that you withhold his levied host, collected for this expedition. York lies, he might have sent and had the horse. I owe him little duty and less love, and take foul scorn to fawn on him by sending. The fraud of England, not the force of France, hath now entrapped the noble-minded Talbot. Never to England shall he bear his life, but dies betrayed to fortune by your strife. Come, go. I will dispatch the horsemen straight. Within six hours they will be at his aid. Too late comes rescue. He is tain or slain, for fly he could not, if he would have fled, and fly would Talbot never, though he might. If he be dead, brave Talbot, then adieu. His fame lives in the world, his shame in you. Exeunt. Scene five. The English camp near Bordeaux. Enter Talbot and John his son. O oh, young John Talbot, I did send for thee to tutor thee in stratagems of war, that Talbot's name might be in thee revived when sapless age and weak and stable limbs should bring thy father to his drooping chair. But, O oh, malignant and ill-boding stars, now thou art come unto a feast of death, a terrible and unavoided danger. Therefore, Dear boy, mount on my swiftest horse, and I'll direct thee how thou shalt escape my sudden flight. Come, delay not, be gone. Is my name Talbot, and am I your son? And shall I fly? Oh, if you love my mother, dishonour not her honourable name, to make a bastard and a slave of me. The world will say he is not Talbot's blood, that basely fled when noble Talbot stood. Fly to revenge my death, if I be slain. He that flies so will ne'er return again. If we both stay, we both are sure to die. Then let me stay, and father, do you fly. Your loss is great, so your regard should be. My worth unknown, no loss is known in me. Upon my death the French can little boast, in yours they will. In you all hopes are lost. Flight cannot stain the honour you have won, But mine it will, that no exploit have done. You fled for vantage, every one will swear, But if I bow, they'll say it was for fear. There is no hope that ever I will stay, If the first hour I shrink and run away. Here on my knee I beg mortality, Rather than life preserved with infamy. Shall all thy mother's hopes lie in one tomb? Ay, rather than I'll shame my mother's womb. Upon my blessing, I command thee, go. To fight I will, but not to fly the foe. Part of thy father may be saved in thee. No part of him, but will be shame in me. Or never hadst renown, nor canst not lose it. Yes, your renowned name. Shall flight abuse it? Thy father's charge shall clear thee from that stain. You cannot witness for me being slain. If death be so apparent, then both fly. And leave my followers here to fight and die? 
my age was never tainted with such shame and shall my youth be guilty of such blame no more can i be severed from your side than can yourself yourself in twain divide stay go do what you will the like do i for live i will not if my father die then here i take my leave of thee fair son born to eclipse thy life this afternoon come side by side together live and die and soul with soul from france to heaven fly exeunt scene six a field of battle alarum excursions wherein john talbot is hemmed about and talbot rescues him st george and victory fight soldiers fight the regent hath with talbot broke his word and left us to the rage of france his sword where is john talbot pause and take thy breath i gave thee life and rescued thee from death oh twice my father twice am i thy son the life thou gavest me first was lost and done till with thy warlike sword despite of late to my determined time thou gavest new date when from the dauphin's crest thy sword struck fire it warmed thy father's heart with proud desire of bold-faced victory then leaden age quickened with youthful spleen and warlike rage beat down alenon orleans burgundy and from the pride of gallia rescued thee the ireful bastard orleans that drew blood from thee my boy and had the maidenhood of thy first fight i soon encountered and interchanging blows i quickly shed some of his bastard blood and in disgrace bespoke him thus contaminated base and misbegotten blood i spill of thine mean and right poor for that pure blood of mine which thou didst force from talbot my brave boy here purposing the bastard to destroy came in strong rescue speak thy father's care art thou not weary john how dost thou fare wilt thou yet leave the battle boy and fly now thou art sealed the son of chivalry fly to revenge my death when i am dead the help of one stands me in little stead oh too much folly is it well i wot to hazard all our lives in one small boat if i to-day die not with frenchman's rage to-morrow i shall die with mickle age by me they nothing gain and if i stay tis but the shortening of my life one day in thee thy mother dies our household's name my death revenge thy youth and england's fame all these and more we hazard by thy stay all these are saved if thou wilt fly away the sword of orleans hath not made me smart these words of yours draw life-blood from my heart on that advantage bought with such a shame to save a paltry life and slay bright fame before young talbot from old talbot fly the coward horse that bears me fail and die and like me to the peasant boys of france to be shame's scorn and subject of mischance surely by all the glory you have won and if i fly i am not talbot's son then talk no more of flight it is no boot if son to talbot die at talbot's foot then follow thou thy desperate sire of crete thou icarus thy life to me is sweet if thou wilt fight fight by thy father's side and commendable proved let's die in pride Exeunt. scene seven another part of the field alarum excursions enter talbot led by a servant where is my other life mine own is gone oh where's young talbot where is valiant john triumphant death smeared with captivity young talbot's valour makes me smile at thee when he perceived me shrink and on my knee his bloody sword he brandished over me 
and like a hungry lion did commence rough deeds of rage and stern impatience but when my hungry garden stood alone tendering my ruin and assailed of none dizzy-eyed fury and great rage of heart suddenly made him from my side to start into the clustering battle of the french and in that sea of blood my boy did drench his overmounting spirit and there died my icarus my blossom in his pride oh my dear lord lo where your son is born enter soldiers with the body of john talbot thou antic death which laughs us here to scorn anon from thy insulting tyranny coupled in bonds of perpetuity two talbots winged through the lither sky in thy despite shall scape mortality o thou whose wounds become hard favoured death speak thy father ere thou yield thy breath brave death by speaking whether he will or no imagine him a frenchman and thy foe poor boy he smiles methinks as who should say had death been french then death had died to-day come come and lay him in his father's arms my spirit can no longer bear these harms soldiers adieu i have what i would have now my old arms are young john talbot's grave dies enter charles alencon burgundy bastard of orleans joan la pucelle and forces had york and somerset brought a rescue in we should have found a bloody day of this how the young whelp of talbot's raging wood did flesh his puny sword in frenchman's blood once i encountered him and thus i said though made a youth be vanquished by a maid but with a proud majestical high scorn he answered thus young talbot was not born to be the pillage of a giglot wench so rushing in the bowels of the french he left me proudly as unworthy fight doubtless he would have made a noble knight see where he lies inerst in the arms of the most bloody nurser of his harms hew them to pieces hack their bones asunder whose life was england's glory gallia's wonder oh no forbear for that which we have fled during thy life let us not wrong it dead enter sir william lucy attended herald of the french preceding herald conduct me to the dauphin's tent to know who hath obtained the glory of the day on what submissive message art thou sent submission dauphin tis a mere french word we english warriors wot not what it means i come to know what prisoners thou hast ta'en and to survey the bodies of the dead for prisoners askest thou hell our prison is but tell me whom thou seekest but where's the great alcides of the field valiant lord talbot earl of shrewsbury created for his rare success in arms great earl of washford waterford and valence lord talbot of goodrig and urchinfield lord strange of blackmere lord verdon of alton lord cromwell of wingfield lord furnival of sheffield the thrice victorious lord of falconbridge knight of the noble order of st george worthy st michael and the golden fleece great marshal to henry the sixth of all his wars within the realm of france here is a silly stately style indeed the turk that two and fifty kingdoms hath writes not so tedious a style as this him that thou magnifiest with all these titles stinking and fly-blown lies here at our feet is talbot slain the frenchman's only scourge your kingdom's terror and black nemesis oh were mine eyeballs into bullets turned that i in rage might shoot them at your faces oh that i could but call these dead to life it were enough to fright the realm of france were but his picture left amongst you here it would amaze the proudest of you all give me their bodies that i may bear them hence and give them burial as beseems their worth i think this upstart is old talbot's ghost he speaks with such a proud commanding spirit for god's sake let him have him to keep them here they would but stink and putrefy the air go take their bodies hence i'll bear them hence but from their ashes shall be reared a phoenix that shall make all france afeard 
so we be rid of them, do with them what thou wilt. And now to Paris, in this conquering vein, all will be ours, now bloody Talbot slain. Exempt. End of Act 4 Act 5 of Henry the Sixth, Part 1 by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 5, Scene 1 London, The Palace, Senate. Enter King Henry the Sixth, Gloucester, and Exeter. Have you perused the letters from the Pope? The Emperor and the Earl of Armagnac. I have, my lord, and their intent is this. They humbly sue unto your excellence to have a godly peace concluded of between the realms of England and of France. How doth your grace effect their motion? Well, my good lord, and as the only means to stop effusion of our Christian blood and establish quietness on every side. Ay, marry, uncle. For I always thought it was both impious and unnatural that such a manity and bloody strife should reign among professors of one faith. Beside, my lord, the sooner to effect and sure abide this knot of amity. The Earl of Armagnac, near knit to Charles, a man of great authority in France, proffers his only daughter to your grace in marriage, with a large and sumptuous dowry. Marriage, uncle! Alas, my years are young! And fitter is my study and my books than wanton dalliance with a paramour. Yet call the ambassador, and as you please, so let them have their answers every one. I shall be well content with any choice tends to God's glory and my country's weal. Enter Cardinal of Winchester, in Cardinal's habit, a legate and two ambassadors. What? Is my lord of Winchester installed and called unto a cardinal's degree? Then I perceive that will be verified. Henry the Fifth did sometime prophecy. If once he come to be a cardinal, he'll make his cap co-equal with the crown. My lord's ambassadors, your several suits have been considered and debated on, and therefore are we certainly resolved to draw conditions of a friendly peace, which by my lord of Winchester we mean shall be transported presently to France. And for the proffer of my lord, your master, I have informed his highness so at large, as liking of the lady's virtuous gifts, her beauty, and the value of her dower. He doth intend she shall be England's queen. In argument and proof of which contract, bear her this jewel, pledge of my affection. And so, my lord protector, see them guarded and safely brought to Dover, where in shipped commit them to the fortune of the sea. Exalt all but Cardinal of Winchester and Leggett. Stay, my lord legate. You shall first receive the sum of money which I promised should be delivered to his holiness, for clothing me in these grave ornaments. I will attend upon your lordship's leisure. Aside. Now Winchester will not submit, I trow, or be inferior to the proudest peer. Humphrey of Gloucester, thou shalt well perceive that neither in birth or for authority the bishop will be overborne by thee. I'll either make thee stoop and bend thy knee, or sack this country with a mutiny. Exalt. Scene two. France. Plains in Anjou. Enter Charles, Burgundy, Alencon, Bastard of Orleans, Rainier, Joan La Pucelle, and forces. This news, my lord, may cheer our drooping spirits. Tis said the stout Parisians do revolt and turn again unto the warlike French. Then march to Paris, royal Charles of France, and keep not back your powers and dalliance. Peace be amongst them if they turn to us. Else ruin combat with their palaces. Enter Scout. Success unto our valiant general, and happiness to his accomplices. What tidings send our Scout? I pray thee, speak. The English army that divided was into two parties is now conjoined in one, and means to give you battle presently. Somewhat too sudden, sir, as the warning is, but we will presently provide for them. I trust the ghost of Talbot is not there. Now he is gone, my lord, you need not fear. 
of all base passions, fear is most accursed. Command the conquest, Charles, it shall be thine. Let Henry fret, and all the world repine. Then on, my lords, and France be fortunate. Exeunt. Scene three. Before Angiers. Alarum. Excursions. Enter Joan La Pucelle. The regent conquers, and the Frenchmen fly. Now help, ye charming spells and periapts, and ye choice spirits that admonish me, and give me signs of future accidents. Thunder. You speedy helpers that are substitutes under the lordly monarch of the north, appear and aid me in this enterprise. Enter fiends. These speedy and quick appearance argues proof of your accustomed diligence to me. Now, ye familiar spirits, that are curled out of the powerful regions under earth, help me this once, that France may get the field. They walk and speak not. Oh, hold me not with silence over long. Why, I was wont to feed you with my blood, I lop a member of and give it you in earnest of further benefit, so you do condescend to help me now. They hang their heads. No hope to have redress? My body shall pay recompense, if you will grant my suit. They shake their heads. Cannot my body nor blood sacrifice and treat you to your wanted further ends? Then take my soul, my body, soul and all, before that England give the French the foil. They depart. See, they forsake me. Now the time is come that France must veil her lofty plumed crest and let her head fall into England's lap. My ancient incantations are too weak, and hell too strong for me to buckle with. Now, France, thy glory droopeth to the dust. Exit. Excursions. Re-enter Joan La Pucelle, fighting hand to hand with York. Joan La Pucelle is taken. The French fly. Damsel of France, I think I have you fast. Unchain your spirits now with spelling charms, and try if they can gain your liberty. A goodly prize, fit for the devil's grace. See how the ugly wench doth bend her brows, as if with Circe she would change my shape. Change to a worse shape thou canst not be. Oh, Charles the Dauphin is a proper man. No shape but his can please your dainty eye. A plaguing mischief light on Charles and thee, and may you both be suddenly surprised by bloody hands in sleeping on your beds. Fell banning hag, enchantress, hold thy tongue. I pray thee, give me leave to curse a while. Curse, miscreant, when thou comest to the stake. Exeunt. Alarum. Enter Suffolk, with Margaret in his hand. Be what thou wilt. Thou art my prisoner. Gazes on her. O oh, fairest beauty, do not fear nor fly, for I will touch thee but with reverent hands. I kiss these fingers for eternal peace and lay them gently on thy tender side. Who art thou? Say that I may honour thee. Margaret, my name, and daughter to a king, the king of Naples, whosoe'er thou art. An earl I am, and Suffolk am I called. Be not offended, nature's miracle, thou art allotted to be tamed by me. So doth the swan her downy signet save, keeping them prisoner underneath her wings. Yet if this servile usage once offend, go and be free again as Suffolk's friend. She is going. Oh, stay! I have no power to let her pass. My hand would free her, but my heart says no, as plays the sun upon the glassy streams twinkling another counterfeited beam so seems this gorgeous beauty to mine eyes fain would i woo her yet i dare not speak i'll call for pen and ink and write my mind fie de la pole disable not thyself hath not a tongue is she not here wilt thou be daunted by a woman's sight Ay, beauty's princely majesty is such confounds the tongue and makes the senses rough. Say, Earl of Suffolk, if thy name be so, what ransom must I pay before I pass, for I perceive I am thy prisoner? How canst thou tell she will deny thy suit, before thou make a trial of her love? Why speak'st thou not? 
What ransom must I pay? She's beautiful, and therefore to be wooed. She is a woman, and therefore to be won. Wilt thou accept of ransom, yea or no? Fond man, remember that thou hast a wife. Then how can Margaret be thy paramour? I were best to leave him, for he will not hear. There all is marred, there lies a cooling card. He talks at random, sure the man is mad. And yet a dispensation may be had. And yet I would that you would answer me. I'll win this Lady Margaret. For whom? Why, for my king. Tush, that's a wooden thing. He talks of wood. It is some carpenter. Yet so my fancy may be satisfied, and peace established between these realms. But there remains a scruple in that too. For though her father be the king of Naples, duke of Anjou, and Maine, yet he is poor, and now a nobility will scorn the match. Hear ye, Captain. Are you not at leisure? It shall be so, disdain they ne'er so much. Henry is youthful, and will quickly yield. Madam, I have a secret to reveal. What, though I be enthralled? He seems a knight, and will not any way dishonour me. Lady, say to listen what I say. Perhaps I shall be rescued by the French, and then I need not crave his courtesy. Sweet madam, give me a hearing in a cause. Tush! Women have been captivate ere now. Lady, wherefore talk you so? I cry you mercy. Tis but quid for quo. Say, gentle princess, would you not suppose your bondage happy to be made a queen? To be a queen in bondage is more vile than as a slave in base servility, for princes should be free. And so shall you, if happy England's royal king be free. Why, what concerns his freedom unto me? I'll undertake to make thee Henry's queen, and put a golden sceptre in thy hand, and set a precious crown upon thy head, if thou wilt condescend to be my— What? His love. I am unworthy to be Henry's wife. No, gentle madam, I unworthy am to woo so fair a dame to be his wife, and have no portion in the choice myself. How say you, madam? Are ye so content? And if my father please, I am content. Then call our captains and our colours forth, and, madam, at your father's castle walls we'll crave a parley to confer with him. A parley sounded. Enter Rainier on the walls. See, Rainier, see thy daughter prisoner. To whom? To me. Suffolk. What remedy? I am a soldier, and unapt to weep, or to exclaim on fortune's fickleness. Yes, there is remedy enough, my lord. Consent, and for thy honour give consent. Thy daughter shall be wedded to my king, whom I with pain have wooed and won thereto. And this her easy-held imprisonment hath gained thy daughter princely liberty. Speak Suffolk as he thinks. Fair Margaret knows that Suffolk doth not flatter face or fame upon thy princely warrant i descend to give the answer of thy just demand exit from the walls and here i will expect thy coming trumpet sound enter rainier below welcome brave earl into our territories command in anjou what your honour pleases thanks rainier happy for so sweet a child fit to be made companion with a king what answer makes your grace unto my suit? Since thou dost deign to woo her little worth, to be the princely bride of such a lord, upon condition I may quietly enjoy mine own, the country Maine and Anjou, free from oppression or the stroke of war, my daughter shall be Henry's if he please. That is her ransom. I deliver her. And those two counties I will undertake your grace shall well and quietly enjoy. And I again, in Henry's royal name, as deputy unto that gracious king, give thee her hand for sign of plighted faith. Rainier of France, I give thee kingly thanks, because this is in traffic of a king. Aside. And yet methinks I could be well content to be mine own attorney in this case. I'll over then to England with this news, and make this marriage to be solemnized. So farewell, Rainier. Set this diamond safe in golden palaces as it becomes. I do embrace thee, as I would embrace the Christian prince, King Henry, were he here. Farewell, my lord. 
Good wishes, praise, and prayers shall Suffolk ever have of Margaret. Going. Farewell, sweet madam. But hark you, Margaret, no princely commendations to my king. Such commendations as becomes a maid, a virgin, and his servant, say to him. Words sweetly placed and modestly directed. But, madam, I must trouble you again. No loving token to his majesty? Yes, my good lord, a pure unspotted heart, never yet taint with love, I send the king. And this withal. Kisses her. That for thyself. I will not so presume to send such peevish tokens to a king. Exalt, Rainier and Margaret. Oh, wert thou for myself. But, Suffolk, stay, thou mayst not wander in that labyrinth. There minotaurs and ugly treasons lurk. Solicit Henry with her wondrous praise. Bethink thee on her virtues that surmount and natural graces that extinguish art. Repeat their semblance often on the seas, that when thou comest to kneel at Henry's feet, thou mayst bereave him of his wits with wonder. Exit. Scene four. Camp of the York in Anjou. Enter York, Warwick, and others. Bring forth that sorceress condemned to burn. Enter Joan La Pucelle, guarded, and a shepherd. O oh, Joan, this killed thy father's heart outright. Have I sought every country far and near, and now it is my chance to find the out. Must I behold thy timeless, cruel death? O oh, Joan, sweet daughter Joan, I die with thee. Take repeat me, sir, base, ignoble wretch. I am descended of a gentler blood, thou art no father nor no friend of mine. Out, out, my lord, and please you, tis not so. I did bigot her, all the parish knows. Her mother liveth yet, can testify she was the first fruit of my battleship. Graceless, wilt thou deny thy parentage? This argues what her kind of life hath been, Wicked and vile, and so her death concludes. Fie, John, that thou will be the obstacle. God knows who art the colop of my flesh, And for thy sake I have shed many a tear. Did I me note, I pray thee, gentle Joanne. Peasant, I won't. You have suborn this man of purpose to obscure my noble birth. It is true. I gave a noble to the priest, and mourned that I was wedded to her mother. Kneel down and take my blessing to my girl. Will you not stoop? Now cursed be the time of thy nativity. My world the milk thy mother gave thee, when the sucked her breast, had been a little rat's bane for thy sake. Or else, when to didst keep my lambs afield, I wish some ravenous wolf had hidden thee. Dost thou deny thy father, cursed drab? Oh, burn hair, burn air, hanging is too good. Exit. Take her away, for she hath lived too long to fill the world with vicious qualities. First, let me tell you whom you have condemned. Not me begotten of a shepherd swain, but issued from the progeny of kings, virtuous and holy, chosen from above, by inspiration of celestial grace, to work exceeding miracles on earth. I never had to do with wicked spirits, but you, that are polluted with your lusts, stained with the guiltless blood of innocence, corrupt and tainted with a thousand vices, because you want the grace that others have, you judge it straight a thing impossible to compass wonders but by help of devils. No, misconceived. Joan of Arc hath been a virgin from her tender infancy, chaste and immaculate in very thought, whose maiden blood, thus rigorously effused, will cry for vengeance at the gates of heaven. Ay, ay, away with her to execution. And hark ye, sirs, because she is a maid, spare for no faggots, let there be a now. Place barrels of pitch upon the fatal stake, that so her torture may be shortened. Will nothing turn your unrelenting hearts? 
Then, Joan, discover thine infirmity, that warranteth by law to be thy privilege. I am with child, ye bloody homicides. Murder not then the fruit within my womb, although ye hail me to a violent death. Now, heaven forfend, the holy maid with child. The greatest miracle that e'er ye wrought, is all your strict preciseness come to this? She and the Dauphin have been juggling. I did imagine what would be her refuge. Well, go to. We'll have no bastards live, especially since Charles must father it. You are deceived. My child is none of his. It was Alençon that enjoyed my love. Alençon, that notorious Machiavel, it dies, and if it had a thousand lives. Oh, give me leave, I have deluded you. It was neither Charles, nor yet the duke I named, but Regnier, king of Naples, that prevailed. A married man! That's most intolerable. Why, here's a girl. I think she knows not well. There were so many whom she may accuse. It's sign she hath been liberal and free. And yet, forsooth, she is a virgin, pure. Strumpet, thy words condemn thy brat and thee. Use no entreaty, for it is in vain. Then lead me hence, with whom I leave my curse. May never glorious sun reflect his beams upon the country where you make abode. Darkness and the gloomy shade of death environ you, till mischief and despair drive you to break your necks or hang yourselves. Exit. Guarded. Break thou in pieces and consume to ashes, thou foul accursed minister of hell. Enter Cardinal of Winchester, attended. Lord Regent, I do greet your excellence with letters of commission from the king. For know, my lords, the states of Christendom, moved with remorse of these outrageous broils, have earnestly implored a general peace betwixt our nation and the aspiring French. And here at hand the Dauphin and his train approacheth to confer about some matter. Is all our travail turned to this effect? After the slaughter of so many peers, so many captains, gentlemen, and soldiers that in this quarrel have been overthrown, and sold their bodies for their country's benefit, shall we at last conclude effeminate peace? Have we not lost most part of all the towns, by treason, falsehood, and by treachery, our great progenitors had conquered? O oh, Warwick, Warwick, I foresee with Grief, the utter loss of all the realm of France. Be patient, York. If we conclude a peace, it shall be with such strict and severe covenants as little shall the Frenchmen gain thereby. Enter Charles, Alencon, Bastard of Orleans, Rainier, and others. Since, lords of England, it is thus agreed that peaceful truce shall be proclaimed in France, we come to be informed by yourselves what the conditions of that league must be. Speak, Winchester, for boiling choler chokes the hollow passage of my poisoned voice by sight of these our baleful enemies. Charles and the rest, it is enacted thus, that in regard King Henry gives consent of mere compassion and of lenity to ease your country of distressful war and suffer you to breathe in fruitful peace, you shall become true liegeman to his crown. And Charles, upon condition thou wilt swear to pay him tribute, submit thyself, thou shalt be placed as viceroy under him, and still enjoy thy regal dignity. Must he be then as shadow of himself, adorn his temples with a coronet, and yet in substance and authority, retain but privilege of a private man? This proffer is absurd and reasonless. "'Tis known already that I am possessed with more than half the Dalian territories, and therein reverenced for their lawful king. Shall I, for lucre of the rest unvanquished, detract so much from that prerogative as to be called but the viceroy of La Hole? No, Lord Ambassador, I'd rather keep that which I have than, coveting for more, be cast from possibility of all.' "'Insulting Charles!' Hast 
thou by secret means used intercession to obtain a league and now the matter grows to compromise stand'st thou aloof upon comparison either accept the title thou usurp'st of benefit proceeding from our king and not of any challenge of desert or we will plague thee with incessant wars my lord you do not well in obstinacy to cavil in the course of this contract if once it be neglected ten to one we shall not find like opportunity to say the truth it is your policy to save your subjects from such massacre and ruthless slaughters as are daily seen by our proceeding in hostility and therefore take this compact of a truce although you break it when your pleasure serves how sayest thou charles shall our condition stand it shall only reserved you claim no interest in any of our towns of garrison then swear allegiance to his majesty as thou art knight never to disobey nor be rebellious to the crown of england thou nor thy nobles to the crown of england so now dismiss your army when ye please hang up your ensign let your drums be still for here we entertain a solemn peace Exalt. scene five london the palace enter Sulfic in conference with king henry the sixth gloucester and exeter your wondrous rare description noble earl of beauteous margaret hath astonished me her virtues graced with external gifts do breed love's settled passions in my heart and like as rigour of tempestuous gusts provokes the mightiest hulk against the tide so am i driven by breath of her renown either to suffer shipwreck or arrive where i may have fruition of her love tush my good lord this superficial tale is but a preface of her worthy praise the chief perfections of that lovely dame had i sufficient skill to utter them would make a volume of enticing lines able to ravish any dull conceit and which is more she is not so divine so full replete with choices of all delights but with as humble lowliness of mind she is content to be at your command command i mean a virtuous chase intense to love and honour henry as her lord and otherwise will henry ne'er presume therefore my lord protector give consent that margaret may be england's royal queen so shall i give consent to flatter sin you know my lord your highness is betrothed and to another lady of esteem how shall we then dispense with that contract and not deface your honour with reproach as doth a ruler with unlawful oaths one that at a triumph of having vowed to try his strength forsaketh yet the list by reasons of his adversary's odds a poor earl's daughter is on equal odds and therefore may be broke without offence why what i praise margaret more than that her father is no better than an earl although in glorious titles he excel yes lord her father is a king the king of naples and jerusalem and of such great authority in france as his alliance will confirm our peace and keep the frenchmen in allegiance and so the earl of armagnac may do because he is near kinsman unto charles beside his wealth doth warrant a liberal dower where rania sooner will receive than give a dower my lords disgrace not so your king that he should be so abject base and poor to choose for wealth and not for perfect love henry is able to enrich his queen and not seek a queen to make him rich so worthless peasants bargain for their wives as market men for oxen sheep or horse marriage is a matter of more worth than to be dealt with by attorneyship not whom we will but whom his grace affects must be companion of his nuptial bed therefore lord since he affects her most it most of all these reasons bindeth us in our opinion she should be preferred for what is wedlock forced but a hell an age of discourse and continual strife whereas the contrary brings bliss and is a pattern of celestial peace whom should be matched with henry being a king but margaret that is daughter to a king her peerless feature joined with her birth approves her fit for none but for a king her valiant courage and undaunted spirit more than in women commonly is seen will answer our hope in issue of a king for henry 
son unto a conqueror is likely to beget more conquerors, if with a lady of so high resolve as his fair Margaret he be linked in love. Then yield, my lords, and here conclude with me that Margaret shall be queen, and none but she. Whether it be through force of your report, my noble lord of Suffolk, or for that my tender youth was never yet attaint with any passion of inflaming love, I cannot tell. But this I am assured. I feel such sharp dissension in my breast, such fierce alarums both of hope and fear, as I am sick with working of my thoughts. Take, therefore, shipping. Post, my lord, to France. Agree to any covenants, and procure that Lady Margaret do vouchsafe to come, to cross the seas to England, and be crowned King Henry's faithful and anointed queen. For your expenses and sufficient charge, among the people gather up a tenth. Be gone, I say, for till you do return I rest perplexed with a thousand cares. And you, good uncle, banish all offence. If you do censure me by what you were, not what you are, I know it will excuse this sudden execution of my will. And so, conduct me where from company, I may revolve and ruminate my grief. Exit. I, grief, I fear me. Both, at first and last. Exalt, Gloucester, and Exeter. Thus Suffolk hath prevailed, and thus he goes, as did the youthful Paris once to Greece with hope to find the like event in love. But prosper better than the Trojan did. Margaret shall now be queen and rule the king, but I will rule both her, the king, and realm. Exit. End of Act 5 End of Henry the Sixth, Part 1 By William Shakespeare